bigger plan for this evening, but that's, uh, that has changed. The plan has changed, and she will be here Wednesday night to share what she has on the heart. So we'll look before you're married on Wednesday night. Well, who has a song you'd like to share tonight? And it's not been very long ago that Jillian done a good job of singing for us and haven't heard anything since that. We would like to hear it sometime. Okay. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I, I enjoyed seeing the young people get up here and sing, and I hope that they'll feel more like getting up here to sing more. <laughs> Amen. Let's go right. You can go. Yes, number four. <laughs> Christmas theme and also brings in the time of Easter whenever our Lord died on the cross. And, you know, Christmas is the promise that he gave to the Israelites that he would send a Savior and then Easter is the proof that he died on the cross and he's to forgive everybody's sins that we might have eternal life if we believe in the Lord and trust in him.
died on the cross for my sins, and that he saved me years ago, and I just want to do what I can to stay faithful. Amen. along with our sermon a little bit this morning, <coughs> all the things that Jesus did while he was on this planet Earth. It's in that song book right there. I was sitting around last night uh, singing a couple songs and just uh, come across this one. I think we heard it on, on a program on TV. I said, I hadn't heard that for a good while. I need to sing it some. I got to get my glasses. Well, he's getting his glasses one of them. Say some of the people that's online watching tonight is Betty Frost, Amy Hook, Carol Moore, Dorothy Strickland, and Racine Lyman. We just want to say we're glad you're watching. Amen. Now, probably some of you have sung this song or know this song, so if you do, we'll just go right ahead and jump in and talk about it.
him died over him or did he do it wrong yeah, or whatever. Right. But you know, the song is when he reached out his hand for me. And I remember that night. It was in 1985. It was on a Thursday night. And um, Milton Campbell was the man standing beside of me. And he said that I kept swaying this way and that way. And he said, finally, I just shot out of there, you know. And I thank the Lord. I've never been the same since then. There's been something. And some people, they get saved. And it's just like they go down with the monitor. And I know my cousin, uh, she was saved at the time. She said, rejoice, well, you're going to fall down. And I went to Dave Hopkins, my pastor, and I said, well, when was that going to happen? You know, and I'm glad to say that it's been 35 plus years now. And I've not cooled down. I want to be at church. I want to serve my Lord and Savior. I want to learn more about Him. I can't get enough learning. And uh, I tell the ladies in the Bible study, I just love teaching, talking, and Daisy can tell you, I, I do a lot of talking there. <laughs> we all do. But, uh, I just love, I can't get enough of my Lord and Savior. He's the best thing that happened to me. And I love Christmas time. And yesterday, the kids were out. Like I said, they stayed Friday night. And when I got dressed yesterday, I put on a He is Risen shirt. And I was so hoping that they would ask me, why didn't you have an Easter shirt on? And I was going to say, Christmas doesn't amount to anything if Easter didn't happen. But it did. My Lord and Savior was born, but he didn't stay in that cradle. He grew up and he went to the Amen. cross for Joyce King. He went for everyone else, but he did something for me personally that no one else could do. And I just praise his name tonight, and I love him. Amen. Aren't you glad that he did reach down? Amen. And pull us out of sin. Everybody has their story. Everybody has their testimony. How it how it happened to them, and it was a uh, interesting for me. It was a, quite a process of about three months of conviction and in and out of it. And uh, finally, I glad to give in when I understood it. That's all I was waiting on. I just don't, I don't truly truly understand it now, but I understood it enough to say yes to it. And he saved me. And he's kept me ever since. Who else has something to share tonight? Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. We thank you for the testimonies and the songs up to this point, Lord. And now as we, Bob gets ready to have the scripture, we ask you to give him that special anointing, Lord. Not his words, not his thoughts, but what you'd have him to say. And help us to be attentive, help us to listen. And not just the ones that are here, but the ones that are listening online, Lord. That maybe some of us will hear something that will help us to grow closer to you. Or if someone's unsaved, maybe something that will spur their desire to become a Christian, Lord. We just ask you right now in your precious and holy name, and amen. Amen. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me see. Pretty much I can say this without too much reservation. I'm sure there'll be a few exceptions, but generally, everybody likes the Christmas season, right? Amen. Okay. You all said amen. Amen? Amen. amen. Okay. Who wants me to, to want to tell, be the first to tell us what you like about it? It seems like everybody is more friendly at Christmas time. Amen. And they're always saying, Merry Christmas to you when you see them out on the street. Amen. Say. Amen. And I, I like that. It oh, seems like there's a sense of excitement. And I don't know if that's just from little children looking forward, but, or when we were small and, you know, that sense of excitement, but it seems like a sense of excitement too. Amen. All right, who else? 
Everybody can participate. You all like Christmas. You just take a shortcut if you want to. So say something short. I think it's the time. Sometimes through the year, we maybe don't spend money on people or something. But when we stop and think about God sending His Son, then sometimes it's easier to spend a little more money than we would normally on people that we love that we want to do something special for. And, um, you know, it's just uh, there's something in the air. I don't know what it is, but uh, even unsaved people sense that spirit and stuff. And I just like it. All right, who else wants to share something? You know, back before 2003, when I say Christmas to me was nothing but about the presents and having to spend money if you didn't want to. <laughs> and nowadays, since then, it's I, I, I said I'm content. I don't need anything, don't want anything. I just praise the Lord for what He's given me the years. Yeah. He's probably good because back when I was in my 40s, I said I ain't gonna make it to 50s where I'm going. And then I made it to 50s. Went through the 60s, now I'm getting very really good. I'm through the 70s now, so we'll see what happens. What the Amen. Ages, so <laughs> God praise the Lord for the years He has given me. And uh, I really enjoy the Christmas season now more than I used to. Amen. I've got the patty and help a fellow place and don't grumble too much anymore. <laughs> used to grumble when I had to help a fellow up. Mm-hmm. Anymore, I just enjoy it. Now. So I praise Amen. the Lord for everything He does. Amen. Well, Christmas is a, a wonderful time. That one song, and that, I don't know all the words to it, but it said it's the most wonderful time of the year. Amen. And about everybody really thinks that. You can talk to people that doesn't even believe in, in salvation. They don't believe in Christ. They really, they're not atheists, but they're just kind of agnostics. They don't really believe in anything. But yet still, they love to the Christmas season because there's something they're looking for that's in that Christmas season. And I read this verse 15, or 13 in chapter 15, because it has the three main elements, I think, of what makes Christmas so special. And you see it sometimes pasted on the side of a barn, maybe, or on the side of somebody's house. And it says, uh, the God of hope, so there's hope is one of them, fill you with all joy and peace. So hope, joy, and peace. That's really what we're all, that's what we all desire. We desire each one of them. We'll take a look at each one of them just for a little bit. And we're going to look at joy to start with because joy is that attribute of God that He allows Christians to experience. And, and some of you that maybe have listened by a live stream, maybe you're not saved. I don't know about that. But if you're not, if there's somebody out there that's not saved, you do not know what joy is. You don't know verse 10. You may know, think you know, you may have an idea, but you, don't, you, you can only know joy by experiencing joy. It's just something that's not affected by circumstances. You know, happiness was affected by circumstances. If you are anticipating getting a certain gift for Christmas and you get it, you'll be happy. If you don't get it, you'll be sad. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Some cases. But if joy is not affected by what you get or what you don't get. It's not affected by, uh, you know, who comes over, who doesn't come over. Or, you know, whether or not that you're sick or you're well. That's not affected by that. You have joy no matter what. It's that stir inside. It's that the bubbling up inside. That's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And it's just an experience of joy. And, you know, a lot of people has had joy. And they experienced it. They allowed it to kind of leak out. Kind of get away from them. Amen? Mm-hmm. It happens sometimes. And I think everyone has probably experienced it somewhere in your Christian walk. Where you felt the joy kind of leaving your salvation experience and you felt like you just wasn't all that you once was and you had to start searching, start soul searching. Sometimes God will allow you to kind of go through a little dry time just to increase your faith. But, uh, you know, if it goes very long, I would be concerned and I'd start saying, Lord, why is it that I don't feel that joy that I once felt? And I would seek Him with all my heart and I'm sure that He desires that you have joy. He wants you to have joy. In fact, He, he said in His, as He spoke to His disciples, he said, uh, as the Father had loved me, in John 15, 9, as the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says, verse 11, the, the key to it, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. So he's telling them what to do. He says, what you do is basically you're fulfilling the two great commandments of loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, your neighbors, yourself. And you keep loving people. You keep abiding in his love. And you keep his commandments. You do what he wants you to do. And then by doing that, 
Yeah, that opens the door for him to flood your heart with joy. And joy is a great part of Christmas, isn't it? You see that, like I say, on a lot of, there's a lot of uh, Christmas decorations that has the word joy in it. And every time I see it, I think there's a lot of the world does not know what that is. They don't understand it. They kind of get the, the concept, but they don't really understand it. So, in, in Luke 2.10, you see the angel made an announcement and said, uh, the angel said, And then fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings and great joy, which shall be to all people. So the fact that Christ came, it's a great joy because he brought joy into our hearts. Now, if you're uh, here tonight, and, I mean, and we don't have a big crowd tonight, but you could be here tonight, you could be one of those people that the joy is not like it used to be, or not what you think it should be. And you can get that renewed tonight. That's, that's something God wants you to have. It's his desire you have it. He tells you what to do, the same as he told his disciples. He said, you keep my commandments, abide in my love. He advised to keep my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And that your joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. So that's what you need for joy. So joy is the, the first one I have on the list. And the next thing I have on the list is one that I think we all really like this one. And that's peace. Amen. True peace. Peace is uh, something that is sought after by the whole world, but yet still the whole world wants to seek after it in the way that they will take it and take it away from somebody else so they can have it. Think about why wars are fought. Wars are fought because somebody wants to be overpowering somebody else. They want to be uh, the power struggle that goes on. And so they think once they get that, that the power over everybody else, then they'll have peace with everything because they got all they want. But that's totally opposite of the truth. Basically, how you get peace is when you decide you don't want anything. You just kind of separate yourself from all your desires, all your wants, and just to seek Jesus with all your heart, and he wants to put peace in your heart. Now, I think the best way to describe peace for me is, is before I got saved, I mentioned earlier in the service, it was about three months there, that my whole soul inside was just in a turmoil. The devil was telling me that the, this, there's nothing to this thing about Christianity, and, and God was dealing my heart, and, and yearning, and pulling on me, and there was a war going on down inside, and there was no peace for that two or three months. It was not a peaceful time. Uh, Joyce would go to church sometimes, and sometimes I'd go with her, and sometimes I wouldn't. She wasn't saved yet, but she was going to church. But, but I wanted the answers. I wanted to know how this whole thing works. It's like I am. I, I, Doug can understand this because he's a mechanic too. If I want to deal with anything at all, I want to know the ins and outs. I want to know how it works. I don't know why it works. Then I can fix it if it breaks. See? That's, that's my thing. But uh, it's really it's not something you can totally understand. But that turmoil was going on. There was no peace inside. But that night that I came to all her prayer, and knelt down and received Jesus Christ in my heart and really believed with all my heart. And this is a long story to it. You've all heard enough times, but that's when true peace came in. Amen. Peace on the inside. Now there's peace. You can have somewhat peace on the outside. I, as most of you have been to our house, and if you've been to our house, you know, uh, not bragging on our house, but we set our house up in a way that there's not hardly really traffic around. There's not much going on out there except just me and George sitting with our feet propped up when we get a chance to sit down. And it's a peaceful place to me. It's a peaceful place. And my home is my, my place that I can come on the outside. That's where I have special peace. But you see, I don't have to get in that place to have peace on the inside. Amen. Because God wants to give me peace on the inside. They can be a fight brewing right around me. Two people getting and punching each other out, and I can still have peace inside. Mm -hmm. So outside peace can be acquired by finding that tranquil place, that place where there's no noise and nothing bothering you. And when the Christians need that a lot, we need to have that. We can find that place of outside peace where we sit down and just allow God to deal with our hearts and speak to us and minister to us. But yet still, the true peace that Jesus is talking about, why he came to this earth to give us, is an internal peace where we got set. And as, if you've got something going on that you're questioning about, and as a Christian, I think it's a normal as we grow up as a Christian, we encounter different things that we come up to, and maybe something you never did look at to have anything that you even suspicion it would be wrong to do. All of a sudden, you're questioning: Is that should a Christian do that? Says, I'm doing that. And should I be doing that? Is that something a Christian should do or not do? And that's the Holy Spirit coming to to stir you up. He's not coming to make a war in your heart. But he's coming to so you can secure that peace. Because if you if you go down the path once the Holy Spirit says don't do that, you become disobedient to Him the peace and the joy will leak out. But if you just seek him and say, Lord, if you want me to do this, I will do it. If you want me to quit doing this, I'll do it, whatever it may be. And he's just very quick to restore the peace and make sure peace stays on. 
uh, a light in your heart. So there's a, a lot of things about peace. You know, there's a internal peace, and there's, of course, peace with your fellow man. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So it's important we have peace with our fellow man, but the, the internal peace is what's the most important thing. I know the song, and I, I wish we could sing it. We probably have it on our overhead. The only real peace that I had, dear Lord, is in you. Amen. Y'all know that? The only real peace that, that I have, dear Lord, is in you. Well, the only true peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. With all life's frustrations, I need you. I surely do. And the only real peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. Well, you do such a good job singing, but you get the point. Good words to that song. The only peace I have, the true peace I have, Amen. is that eternal peace that Jesus Amen. gives me. I'm glad for joy. I'm glad for peace. Aren't you glad for joy and peace? Amen. But in this day we're living in right now, the one we probably really grab a hold of is tight or tired of anything is hope. We're living in a time right now when we can look around and we can allow the circumstances around us to make it look like we're in some sort of a hopeless situation. You know, for me, my, my year has been a very uh, topsy-turvy year. I started out early in the year with a, a knee surgery, turned into an infection that could have taken my life. And it was, a, it was kind of a questionable thing for a little while. And God brought me out of that and brought me through that. And it's been all of this year recovering, getting more and more recovered from that. And my knee is the best it's been all year, so thank God for that. But then uh, COVID comes along. And then the next thing you know, you're dodging that. Everywhere you go, you hope you're dodging. So you're wearing your mask, you're keeping your distance and all that. And all of a sudden, you find out you got COVID. So uh, you don't know if you're going to live or die. You hope you're going to live through it. But God brought us through that. So it's, it's been good. And all of his experiences has brought me closer to him. It has. It's caused me to, to look at him in a different way, and even a closer way, and it's brought me closer to the ones I love. I, I made a commitment last year that I would spend more time and be a better grandpa. I thought I was a pretty good grandpa, but I thought I could get better and uh, spend more time. But sometimes when all the kids get together, sometimes it's a little overwhelming for me, and what I want to do is go to the garage and forget it. Amen. But, but I've not been doing it, right, Joyce? No, Amen. Right. I've been sticking it out, and we've been having a lot of fun. And it seems like they're growing up a little bit, and, and I'm growing with them a little bit. So it's all been good. But we can look at the, the year 2020 and say it's just been so it's a year that there's not a lot of hope in, but there is great hope. God gives us hope. He wants us to have hope. I wrote down a little note here that I just come up with this morning. I think hope, the definition I have of hope is an unfinished blessing. Amen. Think about that. Amen. And I kind of got it from Romans 8:24 where it says that we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why yet doth he yet hope for? So he says anything you already got, it's not anything you're hoping for, because once you get it, you no longer are in the state of hoping for it, you're now possessing it. So there's always something in our life, there's always something out there that we're really hoping for. And then I'll, I like that verse 25 says, for if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. And then you jump down that same chapter, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, them who are the called according to His purpose. So I think we're all probably hoping for some things around Christmas. Probably, like Joy said, it's one of the fun joys of Christmas is giving gifts to each other and, and finding people you love the most and trying to really make them happy with something you think they really would like to have, which is quite a challenge for all of us, but you probably got some things in your Listen, you think, I kind of hope I can get this for Christmas. I hope I throw enough hints around to get this for Christmas, you know. And you may have hope to get that, and I hope that you do get what you want. I hope that you do. But the hope is kind of a fun part of it. That's a fun part of Christmas, you know. The anticipation uh, when Christmas Day comes or whenever you open your gifts up and you open that gift and there you've got what you wanted. And it's, uh, you know, the longer you live, it's harder to find something that somebody really wants or needs. And, and it's really a struggle to buy something for someone else that, that has everything. So, but yet still we have hope. But you know the big hope that I have, I have hopes of, of the world that we live in. I, you know, I know that the Bible tells us and teaches that the things will wax worse and worse. We'll get, as time goes by, you'll see more and more sin 
uh, just being naked and open to the world to where uh, sin is just like the normal and that's what the world wants us to think is normal. We don't want to ever get used to sin. We don't want to ever get to where we think, well, that, I used to think that's bad, but I guess maybe that's okay now. Not the, not the case. If it's sin 50 years ago or 100 years ago, it's sin today. And we don't ever get used to that. But you know, we can hope that our loved ones will get in before it's too late. That's a great hope I have. You know, God has blessed me this year to see my, find out that my sister uh, come to know, come renew her relationship with God. And she's doing great, going to church every service and talking Jesus to me on the phone. And just uh, exciting to know that. And I had that hope for years. I mean, I prayed for her for literally 25 or so years, or maybe 30 years. I don't know. She got in the very same revival I got in. And then uh, just so things happened, whatever, and it didn't, didn't work out. And uh, she kind of got back away from the Lord. And I know she probably over those years, I don't think she ever would have been somebody who would have been an atheist by all means. She wasn't like that. But she just got away from church. She got away from the Lord. But she just came back. And she was excited to tell me about it. And I was excited to hear about it. So that hope I had for all those years uh, come to reality. So now I don't hope for that no more. It's like Paul said. I've already got that. God has, has dealt with my sister. She's listened and she's come back. And it's great news. But I have other unsaved loved ones that's not come back, and they're not. The, they, some of them are backslidden, some of them have never been saved, and I still pray for them. There's people in the church connected to the church. A lot of your loved ones that I know, almost every one of your loved ones' names, your husbands, your, your wives, your kids, or whatever, and I know a lot about what's going on with them because I care for them and I pray for them, and I hope to hear the news someday that some of them get saved. There's several that I don't name their names. I don't want anybody to have to be watching by the, the live stream, and it's got to, I got to operate a little different nowadays. I don't want to name anybody out to make them feel uncomfortable. I don't want to do that, but there's a lot of people out there that I hope to see saved. I have high hopes of. I believe Jesus Christ died for their sins. I believe he, he gave everything he had for them, and I think he didn't do it in vain. All they have to do is say yes. All they have to do is get unconviction like I did and like you did and come and say yes, so I have a great hope for that. You know, we have a lot of things that we have hope in. We have hope in God's word. You know, when God tells us his word, that he makes promises in his word, then we can take those promises and we can have hopes that even though we may not see it come to pass exactly at the time it starts, but eventually we'll see it happen because when God promises something, God is not a liar like a man is, but he tells the truth So when he makes you a promise, you can claim that promise and then you can have hope that it will come to pass and it will come to pass. We also have hope of a eternal life. Eternal life is one thing that we all desire. We all want to go to heaven when we die. Amen. You may be able to miss a lot of appointments in life, but you won't to miss it, that appointment where it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So we're all going to die someday. Now, I don't live my life just scared to death when death is going to come because whenever it comes, it just comes. You know, it's going to happen someday. We know it's going to happen to us. Uh, I'm not ushering in. I'm enjoying life right now. I'm enjoying trying to win the lost people of Christ and, and preaching and teaching. So I'm enjoying that. But whenever the time comes, I'm ready to go. I really have no reservations to hold on to anything else, but I'm ready to go. But I have hope in eternal life. Titus 3, 7 says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. By His grace, we can someday. And I just get, if you think about what eternal life is like, now that is the hope of heaven, but we've not experienced heaven. We've not got there. So we're still in the, the stage of hoping for him. We've not got it yet. He's promised to us. We believe it's a real thing, but we've not received heaven yet, and we won't until we die. So think about what it would be like to be in a place where there's absolutely no negativity whatsoever, not any whatsoever. Everything is perfect in every way, and everybody is happy, and no one has any qualms with anyone else. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no crying. There's no divorce. There's no uh, funeral, funeral parlors or whatever, funeral homes. There's nothing like that. And you can go on and on on all the things in this world that's, uh, that's related to the temporal things of life will not be in heaven. The eternal things will be there. And I want everybody to go. Amen? Don't you want everybody to go? You want all your loved ones to go. But you know, it's really to, uh, it's up to us to, to allow that hope to bring us to the place where we not only just sit around and hope for it, we take action and try to do something about it and make that hope become reality. So we want eternal life. We have that hope. But you know, there's a lot of people lives in this world 
They live in a state of hopelessness. If you talk to them, you'll find out pretty quick that they don't have much hope. They're just kind of really down on the bottom level of hope. There's some people battling COVID-19 right now that's uh, very the tough stages of it to where they, they may not make it. I think about this family that just lost a grandmother and a grandfather on the same weekend. It's just uh, when I heard the news, I thought, what a terrible thing. But yet still, even in that terrible times, there is hope in Jesus Christ. And we have to put our hope and trust in Him. But if we find someone who has a, is in that hopeless situation, it should be our desire to help them get out of the hopelessness and bring them to the level that they're living in hope. We should live in joy, peace, and hope. That should be the normal for Christianity. So if we see someone that's, that's really lacking in any of those areas, it may be the brother and sister in Christ, it could be someone that doesn't know the Lord. Either way, we should have a desire to be part of us to want to bring people out of that hopeless state because if you look in your Bible, you do a word search, you'll find out the word hopeless is not in the Bible. The word hopeless is in there many, many times. Hopeless, God doesn't want people to live in a hopeless situation. You could be someone that's, uh, maybe someone even listen tonight, someone that doesn't have a job right now. Maybe because of COVID-19 and shut their job down, they don't have a job. It could be someone who's uh, facing Christmas without being able to buy anything for their kids and knowing their kids is going to talk to their friends and they're all going to have gifts and they're not going to have anything. You know, it's up to God's people to help relieve some of those problems. You know someone that's going through something like that. You know someone that's a, a family that's really struggling and it's time to slide in beside that family, help them out some. It's not always money. Money is always a, a factor, but it's not always money. Sometimes they just need someone to talk to them and be able to talk them up to the place to where they now once again have some hope. And give them something to have hope in. Pray with them. A prayer is worth a lot. So it should be up to, us, up to us to find those people who have no hope. And reach out to them and help them. First Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So he's, just, he's referring to those people who are living their life in a hopeless situation. 1 Peter 3.15, to sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So there will be times people will look at you and say, why are you so hopeful? Why do you have this great hope in you? And you be ready to give them an answer because that's your cue right there to share the gospel with them. Peace, joy, and hope. Those three, those three attributes, I think it's what really makes Christmas that special, special time to where everybody, seem, like Patty said, seems to be happier, they get along, they're quicker to speak to you. And you know, a lot of times when you're out shopping, there's a lot of stress out there in the shopping world, whether it be the, the cashier or the person in stocking the shelves or the customers up there that really doesn't have the money to buy the things they'd like to be. And just a, a greeting of Merry Christmas or, you know, uh, have a good day, whatever, a positive greeting can bring a little bit of hope to somebody's life. That should be Christians, amen? And I, I hope that you're all doing it. I, I trust that you are doing some good things like that. Because we all want to have joy and peace and hope in our own hearts, but we want everybody else to have it too, don't we? We don't want to be selfish about this thing. God's got enough to go around for everybody, but you see, he leaves it up to us to kind of scatter it around. We, we're the ones that deliver us. We do that in a positive way. So uh, let Christmas be that joy, peace, and hope time and let it just be exciting and everything that Christmas offers. But you know, most of all, keep our eyes focused on the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth. I heard a song this week that was a, a different kind of song. I couldn't hear the words real good to it without an interview before. I liked the interview. And it said that uh, who would have thought that God would have saved the world in such an unusual way? It's an unusual way in a baby in a manger to grow up and die for the sins of mankind. I'm glad that he did. He gave me joy, and He gave me peace, and He gave me hope, and He did the same for all you. We have something to rejoice about, though. So when you try to think, what do you like about Christmas? Well, you like joy, don't you? You like peace, and you like hope. Amen. All right. That's just stand, if you will. Of course, if we have a few more listening, we have Kirk Mace listen to us, Loma Lane's been listening, and James Davis has been listening. So we're glad you joined our, our uh, live stream tonight. And we hope that someday that we'll be a place where y'all can just come in and sit down and enjoy the live version because I promise you, it's much better. Much better. There's a, there's a special spirit here about people love God. 
Let's bow our head for a minute and ask the Lord to help you. Father, we're thankful for these that have come. If there's any here among us tonight, Lord, we just pray that it has a need and maybe doesn't have the full uh, flowing joy and, and peace and hope in their life that they need to have. We pray that this be a time right now they would uh, come, Lord, and ask you to fulfill that and, and renew that hope. Help them, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anyone have a need in any kind of All right. I do want to say I really appreciate everybody that, uh, you know, have to be seated for just a moment. Appreciate everybody comes out. I know that we're uh, in strange times where we have a very small congregation, and it's not as easy to uh, really